Let's cover all the combat tips you need to know to take on the Forbidden West. Between the thousand plus hours I've spent playing, is that too much? And the countless more my friends who contributed to this video have, you're about to seriously tap into a wealth of Horizon experience. Forbidden West requires a more tactical approach to combat than most other games. Simply peppering a giant robot with arrows or whacking them with your spear is just not effective. Even if you platinum Zero Dawn on Ultra Hard, simply doing what you did in the first game probably isn't going to work. Enemies are tougher out here in the West. They hit harder, have more varied attack and movement patterns, and both their melee and ranged attacks have much stronger tracking. You'll often find it very hard to dodge out of the way. This is compounded by the fact that a lot of machine attacks also now have area of effect damage. The new upgrade system also means your weapons are going to start out weaker, and the same is true for outfits. Gear does eventually get really strong. In fact, I would argue Aloy can be even stronger than she was in Zero Dawn once you have endgame gear. But to get there, you need to progress through a lot of gear and upgrades along the way. Upgrading gear throughout your playthrough is really important. We've also lost some mechanics a lot of players relied on in Zero Dawn. For example, the lure call used to bait machines into tall grass for for stealth kills is no more, but I'll show you a new way to do this. We've also lost the dodge prowess skill, which extended Aloy's dodge a lot. So now you need to time dodges more precisely. Trip casters have also been nerfed pretty hard, traps are more expensive and you can't carry as many, and rope casters are a bit tougher to use as well. It might sound bad to lose all these things, but there's a bunch of new mechanics that give you way more options now. You just need to know what they are and how they work. Let's start with the early stage of the game, which I consider the tutorial through the dawn. Now, Aloy's ranged weapons, which are of course her specialty, are really weak until you get past the dawn. So these early stages actually demand a different playstyle, and two things are key, stealth and a few specific melee tactics. The Silent Strike, which is a stealth takedown Aloy has by default, can kill many early enemies in one shot. This works anytime you're close to an enemy that isn't fully alerted, so as long as the awareness indicator isn't red. For machines, you can also go by their eye color, with blue being unaware and yellow being suspicious. So in the beginning, you want to be sneaking around a lot by crouch walking, which is totally silent, and using silent strike whenever you can. You'll know you're going to get a kill when the little skull icon shows up near the prompt. If you don't get this, then it won't be a kill, but don't worry. If that happens, go ahead and do the silent strike, and then immediately follow up with a power attack, which is done by holding the heavy spear attack button for a moment and then releasing. On PlayStation, that's the R2 trigger, and on PC, it's shift plus left click, though I'm basing that on Zero Dawn controls since I'm making this before Forbidden West is out on PC, so there's a possibility they've changed it. Anyway, while you're doing a power attack, keep in mind that you want to hold the movement input towards the enemy the whole time, even while charging it. Aloy will launch herself forward when you release and cover a surprisingly large gap between you and the enemy. On small enemies like burrowers and scroungers, the power attack will trigger a knockdown, stunning them and letting you do a critical strike, which is similar to a silent strike. Now, if you're quick, you can actually get more than one critical strike in before they get up. Just stay close to the enemy to make sure you get the prompt again as soon as possible. If you want to dive deeper on knockdown mechanics, I'll link my damage types video below where I explain all the details. But for now, just remember power attacks and even regular heavy attacks will trigger knockdowns pretty quickly, even on bigger machines like bristlebacks. The only problem with power attacks is you'll often be attacked while trying to charge one up. The natural reaction is to release the power attack so you can dodge. But releasing starts the animation, which actually prevents you from dodging because you get locked into it. So instead, what you want to do is actually continue holding the power attack and just hit dodge at the same time. You'll dodge no problem, and if you keep holding the power attack input the whole time, Aloy will go straight back into one, so you can use it at the first opportunity. Actually, each time you dodge and start a new power attack, the resonator on your spear gets a bit of charge, eventually building up to a full charge. This this lets you apply a blue resonator target, which can be hit for increased damage. You can also use this power attack dodging trick to charge up the spear for free outside of combat. If you find using melee for knockdowns is just too difficult, you can pick up the knockdown sharp shot bow in Baron Light and use its knockdown arrows. Just remember you need to hit medium and large machines in the leg a few times to trigger knockdowns on them. Getting back to being stealthy though, you definitely want to get in the habit of using the focus to gather intel. Just like in Zero Dawn, scanning a machine 
screen allows you to tag them with a marker and highlight their patrol path. The focus also reveals which elements a machine is weak to and strong against, and it highlights the various components like detachable weapons, weak points, and components you can remove to harvest as crafting and upgrade resources. Remember, you can reference all this info anytime by going into the machine catalog in Aloy's notebook. You'll be able to leverage elemental weaknesses better a little later on once you have some decent gear. So at the beginning, it's the component information that's most useful. Machine components are a super important aspect of combat. These are a machine's weak points, and you always want to aim for them to get a damage boost. Instead of just aiming for the body, which is covered in a bunch of armor that will block most of your damage. While scanning them, the various components on a machine show up around the edge of the focus ring, and you can scroll through to see what they are. If you want to keep components highlighted permanently, you can hit the interact button while scrolling through, and I definitely recommend doing that. Just go ahead and highlight them all. It will give you clear targets to aim for and forces you to at least quickly look through to see what you might be able to exploit. For example, elemental canisters, which can be used to trigger chain reactions. We'll cover those in a minute. In addition to the focus, another core mechanic is concentration. This is a slow motion effect you can trigger anytime while aiming. On controller, you press down the right thumbstick, and on PC, the zero dawn default is left shift. Concentration makes it easier to aim for components and other weak points, and it charges up quickly for free, so don't be afraid to use it liberally. You'll notice the gauge next to the aim reticle shows how much longer concentration will last while you're using it. There's also a hidden mechanic called quick draw that lets you get a concentration-like effect for free, along with some other benefits, but it's a more advanced mechanic, so I'll link my secret combat mechanics video below if you want to learn about it. Another mechanic you'll want to use regularly is the hunter's toolkit, which holds all your potions and tools. Health potions are a bit more powerful now because they can actually overheal you, temporarily increasing your maximum health. We also now have stamina potions, which I'll talk a bit more about when we get to weapon techniques, and cleansing potions, which remove any of the various status effects Aloy can take on, like burning or the new crush state. That one deals damage over time when moving after being stomped on by a big machine. In Zero Dawn, the toolkit is also where you'd find the lure call, but like I mentioned earlier, we don't have it anymore. However, you can use a rock a bit like a lure call by throwing it at your feet. Just make sure you're not throwing the rock while at the very front edge of a grass patch. If you do, when the enemy comes to investigate, they might not get close enough for a silent strike. There's also actually been some changes to how rocks work, which I cover in my stealth masterclass along with a bunch of other stealth tactics linked below. Smoke bombs are a brand new tool, and they're really useful. You'll unlock these after helping a couple of Asaram near the Don Relic Ruin, and they're excellent for regaining control of a chaotic fight. Popping smoke instantly puts all enemies around you into the confused state, making them lose track of you so you can get to safety and regain stealth. They're a bit expensive at the start of the game, so I would only use them as a panic button at first, but if you do need to get some more, instead of crafting them, just buy them from Hunter's Merchants for 60 shards. Another tool to leverage early on are traps. I generally don't recommend using traps throughout the game because they're really resource intensive, but you'll loot a decent amount of them for free and they can give you an edge in early encounters. For any larger machine you need to take down, placing some traps in their patrol path or luring them into the traps from stealth is a smart idea. If an enemy is close to a trap but not quite triggering it, you can trigger it yourself with a rock or any type of ammo. You'll also pick up the shock trip caster through an early main quest. Similar to traps, I don't personally use trip casters throughout the game, but on any difficulty except ultra hard, this thing is actually pretty useful in the early game. It's also cheap to upgrade, which you should do if you're going to use it. The range on trip casters has been reduced, so to tell if a shot is going to anchor, watch for the reticle to change. Once a machine is shocked, you can critical strike them or target canisters and other components. The shock warrior bow, which you can pick up for free at the daunt hunting grounds, is your best option for triggering shock canisters for quite some time, so definitely stop by to pick that up. Something else that can help you in the early game are environmental traps, like logs and hanging platforms, which can be shot down to fall on enemies. These can actually deal a ton of damage, but they can be a bit frustrating because it's sometimes hard to get a machine positioned correctly. But if you have a good opportunity to use one, absolutely take advantage of it. The last basic mechanic you should work on in the early game is movement. As in many games, this is arguably the most important mechanic, but it's often ignored. Trust me though, if you can master anticipating enemy attacks and dodging them properly, you're going to have a lot more fun because you won't be dying every five minutes. My best advice here is to go find a machine or two, make them notice you, wait for their attack, and begin dance practice.
seriously, just spend some time getting familiar with the attack patterns and practicing your dodge timing. You can even turn the difficulty down to story so you can tank hits more easily. My favorite spot for dance practice is this scrounger site near the Daunt Relic Ruin. You'll always get a couple of scroungers here, and you can kill one if you only want one dance partner at first. Though you should practice with two at some point, it's good to get in the habit of repositioning yourself to keep multiple enemies in view. Having enemies to your back is never good. Although, if a machine is off screen, there is an off screen attack indicator you can keep an eye out for. When you can see them, pay close attention to a machine's eye flash that occurs right before an attack. Many attacks have an extended windup that's intended to trick you into dodging too early, so try not to dodge too soon or you can get hit easily. Zero Dawn veterans will also pick up on another difference. Aloy can only dodge three times in a row before stumbling on the fourth. That, combined with the lack of the dodge prowess skill, means that spamming dodge can get you into trouble. Of course, dodges can still certainly be effective, and they're worth practicing, but what you really want to practice is slide dodging. Sliding is faster, covers more ground, and has more invincibility frames than a regular dodge. So it really is the most effective way to dodge in many situations. To slide, you first need to be sprinting, and then you need to hit crouch. I recommend turning on the auto sprint setting to make this easier. There's a bit more you need to know to slide dodge properly, like how not to end up crouched all the time, so I'll link my dedicated video on it down below. Once you're past the daunt, it's time to transition to primarily using bows and other ranged weapons, Aloy's true specialty. But we have a bunch of different ammos with different types of damage. Take a look at your basic hunter arrows and you'll notice they have two damage stats. This one on top with a little arrow icon is impact damage, which is like damage in any other game. It just decreases an enemy's health directly. But we also have this broken shield icon, which is tear damage. Tear damage doesn't decrease a machine's health directly. Instead, it's used to remove components and armor plates. Components are the main thing you'll want to tear off, especially key upgrade resources like a Thunderjaw tail, or weapons like its cannons to disable them. But you will sometimes want to tear off armor plates to uncover the weak points underneath. For example, the data nexus on a Thunderjaw's head. Regardless of what you're trying to remove, when it pops off, it will deal some removal damage, which is basically like impact damage. So tearing off components indirectly decreases a machine's health while also disabling weapons or harvesting useful components. Machines are covered in lots of armor plating though, and these plates block a lot of damage. A regular variant's armor reduces impact damage by 80%. That means you'll only deal 20% of the impact damage your ammo is capable of. That's a huge penalty. And Apex Machine's armor is even worse, reducing impact damage by a whopping 95%. So yeah, you never want to aim at armor plates if you're trying to bring a machine's health down. At a minimum, aim for unarmored parts of the body, and ideally, always aim for a component or weak point to get a 10-60% to 60 damage boost. All machines also have a permanent weak point that gives a 100% damage boost, which is their eyes. Okay, so impact and tear damage are your bread and butter. You're going to want at least one impact and one tear damage focused weapon on your weapon wheel at all times. Now, if you look through every single hunter bow in the game, you'll notice they all deal a lot more tear than impact. That means hunter bows are good for tearing off components, but they're not very good at directly dealing impact damage. So you'll want to use a different weapon for impact damage, like a sharpshot bow. The new bolt blasters and warrior bows are also great options, especially when you use them with a couple specific weapon techniques we'll talk about in a bit. We have a bunch of other damage types in the game too, like elemental and explosive. Explosive damage is primarily dealt with blast sling bombs and explosive spikes on the new spike throwers and it's great when you just want to brute force a bunch of damage on an enemy. Like impact damage, it directly reduces an enemy's health, but it actually ignores armor plates, so you don't need to aim really precisely. The catch is, it will easily destroy components that you might have wanted to collect. There's also no damage multiplier for hitting a component, and only a 25% damage boost on machines in the brittle state, which brings us to elemental damage. Leveraging the various elemental states is another core part of the combat system, and frost, which applies the brittle state is hands down the strongest element in the game for two reasons. First, it negates the effects of all armor, so you can hit a machine anywhere for full damage. And second, it actually gives a huge damage boost to impact damage, between 50 and 100%, depending on where you hit the machine. So yeah, 
Anytime you can freeze a machine, do it. The brittle state builds up like all elemental states. As you begin hitting a machine with frost ammo, the frost icon starts to fill up. Keep applying frost ammo until the icon is full and gets a white ring around the edge, which is a timer showing you how long the elemental state will last. If you stop before getting this ring, a partially filled icon won't give you any benefit, and after a few seconds, it will start to degrade. So once you start building up a state, always try to get the icon filled up all the way. Once you do get a machine brittle, try to get as much damage in as possible. Aiming for weak points and components is great if you can do it, but don't waste time trying to line up the perfect shot. You only have 25 seconds before the frost wears off, and remember, the armor plates are negated, so just body it if you have to. Oh, and armor plates don't block elemental buildup, so when you're trying to apply any element, you can hit a machine anywhere you want. Unfortunately, you won't be able to leverage frost much until you get out of the dawn, because you won't have good frost weapons. In fact, it's a bit tough to leverage any of the elements early on, especially on higher difficulties. In some situations, you can apply shock with the tripcaster and shock warrior bow like we mentioned earlier, so definitely use that whenever you can. But overall, applying elemental states gets much easier once you get some better gear. Unless, of course, you know about chain reactions. A chain reaction is an explosion that occurs when you proc a machine's elemental canister with a corresponding elemental arrow. After a short delay, the canister will explode, dealing damage to the machine's health and also immediately applying the elemental state regardless of their resistance to it. So even with the weakest frost arrow in the game, I can trigger the brittle state on this thunder jaw that's strong against frost. In the early game, the bristlebacks have acid canisters that you can trigger with the acid arrows on your default bow. There's also fire bristlebacks with blaze canisters. Like any other canister explosion, fire explosions do deal some solid damage, but unfortunately the fire element in general has been seriously nerfed since Zero Dawn. Acid on the other hand, one of the new elements is more useful. Gorilla reused the corruption icon from Zero Dawn for acid here in Forbidden West, but acid and corruption are totally different. Corruption is now called Berserk, and it has a new red icon. Acid, on the other hand, is used to build up the corroding state, which causes armor plates to block way less of your impact damage, similar to Frost. You don't get a damage boost, but it will be easier to deal damage with the armor plates compromised. The armor plates will also take tear damage over time while the machine is corroding. That's what this flashing is. So if you apply the corroding state enough times, you can get a machine totally naked. The corroding state also doubles the base critical hit chance of your weapons, increasing the chance of a high damage shot. Critical hits are what's happening when you see a gold damage number as opposed to the normal white. These randomly occur, and each weapon type has a different base chance for getting a critical hit, and multiplier for the damage boost you get when one happens. Anyway, the last thing I want to make sure you know with elemental damage is the difference between these two icons you see on elemental ammo. The bottom one with the little arrow on it is elemental buildup. That's the important one. The higher this number is, the faster you'll be able to build up the elemental state. The top number is elemental damage. Basically, it's just a bit of impact damage that gets dealt while you're using elemental ammo. But there's very few cases where you can make this useful, so you can mostly ignore it. Just remember the elemental buildup stat with the little arrow is the important one. If you want to learn more about the elements, including the other new ones like Purge Water and Plasma, I have a whole elements video I'll link below. In addition to new elements, we also have a totally new, powerful mechanic in Forbidden West called Weapon Techniques. These make your shots more powerful or add new utility to your weapons. Once you unlock a weapon technique in the skill tree, you'll find its icon selectable inside the weapon wheel. To use it, you aim with L2 like normal, but then draw and fire with the R1 bumper instead of the R2 trigger. We don't know what the keybind will be for weapon techniques on PC yet, but I'm guessing it might be something we want to rebind, so keep an eye out for my keybinds video. I'll link it below if I've already made it. Each weapon technique requires a different amount of stamina to fuel it. Stamina is this gold bar in the bottom right, and it recharges passively. However, if you take damage, stamina won't recharge until a few seconds after the damage event ends. Stamina potions will get you back up quickly, and those cleansing potions will remove damaging status effects that prevent stamina from recharging, like burning for example. Now, there are some weapon techniques that are definitely better than others, and I have a whole video on that topic, but I'll also give you tips and some minor updates on my 
recommendations as we talk about weapons. We've mentioned a few different types of weapons so far, but there are four brand new ones, 10 altogether, and dozens of different ammos across all of them. So let's run through some core weapon mechanics and the strengths of each type. You primarily choose weapons based on the ammo types you want access to. Looking at a weapon in the menu, you can see the stats for each ammo type and a list of all the weapon's perks. You'll also see the coil slots, which can be equipped with various coils that increase ammo stats, boost an existing perk, or add a new one. Upgrading weapons will increase ammo stats, unlock new ammos, unlock and upgrade perks, and unlock coil slots. One of the most common perks, which Zero Dawn vets will recognize from the Banuk bows, is Overdraw. In Forbidden West, most weapons now have an Overdraw perk. However, you usually need to upgrade to at least level 1 to unlock it. To Overdraw, you need to hold a shot until you get the whiskers on the reticle. You'll also get an audio cue and the ammo will flash blue. The damage boost is anywhere from 15 to 30%, and it boosts every type of damage, so Overdraw is definitely a great mechanic to utilize. You'll often use Overdraw on your Hunter Bows, like the Starting Bow. Hunter Bows are designed primarily for two things, tearing off components and applying elemental states, either by building up the state directly or triggering canister chain reactions. Now, many of us are in the habit of triple notching almost every shot. Triple notching is great, but it doesn't actually give you triple damage. Instead, it actually works out to only give you 2.1x damage, and that applies to all damage types. So I'm not saying don't use triple notch, it's a great way to start off a fight by applying elemental buildup for example, but in the middle of a fight it's often not worth it to triple notch everything. Sharp shot bows are primarily good for high impact damage, however certain sharp shot bows can also be useful for tear, like the cleaving sharp shot bow you receive fairly early on with its tear precision arrows. You'll also definitely want to play around with the new strike through precision arrows, particularly for huge human enemies. These pierce armor, dealing full damage to the target underneath, though unfortunately you still won't get the headshot multiplier on human enemies. They're also cheaper to craft than advanced precision arrows, but still typically deal more damage than regular ones. In general, you'll want to use the focus shot weapon technique on your sharp shot bow for a 30% damage boost. Early on though, you can unlock brace shot more easily and it will give you more damage on lower rarity bows. Warrior bows are a brand new bow type intended to complement a melee play style, but despite the fact that they deal more tear than impact, the higher rarity ones actually work really well for dealing a lot of impact damage really fast. Warrior bow arrows are also really cheap, costing just ridgewood and shards. To use them effectively though, you need to know how to quickly fire volleys of 5 arrows with a spread shot weapon technique, so I'll link my warrior bow masterclass down below. Another high DPS weapon are the new bolt blasters. These are a bit like the rattler from Zero Dawn, but bolt blasters are way stronger, particularly when you use the spread blast or sustain burst weapon techniques. The downside of course is that they're heavy and slow, but there's no doubt they're really strong. Spike throwers are another new weapon which can be very strong as well. In the early game it's definitely worth picking up the prototype spike thrower from Della and Boomer in Chainscrape. Later on though you should also check out drill spikes, one of my favorite types of ammo. They're good for triggering knockdowns and dealing damage over time. My favorite new weapon though are shredder gauntlets. The whole idea with shredders is that you basically need to play free with the enemy, throwing and catching them to charge them up. Each throw after a successful catch deals more damage until the fourth throw when it explodes. Shredder explosions are unique because instead of destroying components like regular explosions, they deal a bunch of tear damage. This makes shredders excellent for tearing off lots of components and armor plates, dealing a lot of removal damage in the process. They also have some other cool benefits, like certain ammo types deal a decent amount of knockdown damage, making them useful for that too. Learning to catch them is key and it's easier than it initially appears. If you want to learn how and a whole bunch more about shredders, I'll link my masterclass below. We also have a few more weapons that carry over from Zero Dawn. Rope casters are back and they're still useful for tying down machines, but they have some new ammo types and work a little bit differently when trying to attach ropes. So I've got a masterclass for them as well. Blast slings are back too and function pretty much the same way. I personally think their ammo is a little expensive and I don't like how explosive damage destroys components, but they're certainly strong and can be good for applying elements too. We also have trip casters, and there are some new types of trip wires to play around with like stagger beams which can deal damage over time and can knock machines down. If you want to dive deep on the best gear for each stage of the game, I have a whole gear series I'll link below. But right now, we need to talk about coils. These are modifiers for your weapons, and there's a ton of different kinds, giving you a bunch of options. But machines don't drop the best ones like they did in Zero Dawn. Instead, the best coils come from looting boss machines taken down during quests and from hunter merchants 
who have a limited inventory that never restocks. So there's only so many copies of good coils that you can get in one playthrough. If you want some help finding all the good ones, I made a video and accompanying spreadsheet that I'll link below. As for the best way to coil each type of weapon, that's a huge topic as well. In general, I recommend going all in on one particular perk, as opposed to boosting two or three, or using coils that only boost a damage stat. Some of the best coils are concentration, overdraw, critical hit chance, and component tear. Keep in mind that blue and even green coils are still definitely worth using. Their stats are often only a bit below purple ones. If you want to see the best ways to coil every weapon, I'll link that video below too. Of course, alongside weapons, we have plenty of outfit options, almost 50 in total actually, each with their own set of damage resistance stats and skill perks. Throughout the game, the melee resistance stat is the most important one for survivability. That's primarily why I recommend you pick up the Oseram Explorer from the Chain Scrape Merchant as soon as possible for the early game. After green rarity though, outfits at the same rarity level mostly have very similar melee resistance stats. So you should mainly choose your outfit based on its skill perks. Every outfit also comes with a green plus one or blue plus two skill boosting weave. We do still have weaves that boost resistance stats, but the skill boosting ones are pretty much always better. I have a ton of recommendations for outfit and weave builds for every stage of the game in my full guide, of course, linked below. Skills are definitely more complicated than they were in Zero Dawn as well. I have a series on the best starting skills and I'm also working on an updated video, but let me give you the most important ones here. There are four types of skills, square-shaped active ones, inverted diamond-shaped weapon techniques, diamond-shaped valor surges, and the little circular passive ones, which are the most important to understand. Passive skills give you permanent benefits, and each one can operate at multiple levels, maxing out at level four. You'll get two levels from unlocking both skill tree nodes, but to get level three or four, you'll need points from skill perks on outfits or skill boosting weaves. Another way to boost skills, which is especially helpful early on, is with food. Food basically works like a temporary skill perk, plus it also heals you and can provide other benefits. Now, even though you can reset skills and reassign your skill points anytime, it's still important to pick the right ones early on when you have limited points. So I'll link my skill series and the new video below. Another major new mechanic are Valor Surges, which are powerful abilities that can boost damage, make you more resilient, or take down enemies in unique ways. Unlike other skills, they can be permanently upgraded to additional levels after unlocking them. To trigger a Valor Surge, you first need to open the weapon wheel and then hit R1. On PC, I'm sure it will just be a key. Just like weapon techniques are powered by the gold stamina bar, Valor Surges are powered by the purple Valor bar. Unlike stamina though, Valor doesn't build up passively. Instead, you get a bit of Valor each time you hit an enemy, trigger an elemental state, remove a component, or perform an array of other combat actions. You don't need to think about building up Valor too much, it will just happen naturally. What you do need to think about is actually using it. There's a tendency to hang on to Valor until you really need it, especially since once you start a Valor Surge, there's no way to cancel it. But I think you'll find you just never really use them if you're always waiting for the perfect moment. Instead, anytime you could use it, just go for it. You'll have more fun and get more use out of them that way. If you can, it's usually better to pop a Surge at the start of a fight so you can make the most use of it and have some time to build up Valor again. To find the best Valor Surge for you, I have a video breaking down all the best ones. There's also a bunch of settings you'll want to adjust to improve your combat experience, and I've already put those together for you in my Essential Starting Tips video, plus a bunch of other tips I wish I'd known on my first playthrough. So if you haven't already seen that, you definitely need to watch it. I'll make it the first link below. All right, we've covered a ton, including all the essentials, but to take your combat to the next level, I've got a bunch of advanced combat tips for you right here. All those other videos I mentioned are linked below as well. Huge thanks to all my friends who contributed their knowledge and tips to this video. If you love Horizon and you wanna come hang out with us, you're welcome to join my Discord server. Now, I'm gonna head over to that advanced combat tips video. So thank you for watching and I'll see you there in just a second.